they're saying there's a historic injustice that needs to be corrected. Now that's not what they are saying. They are saying that farmers who are currently on the land have stolen that land. Now I wonder why they didn't take the matter to the police. There are legislation in place, there are systems in place. The minister is right. We need to follow due process or we will put this land in the kind of chaos which we have seen in Zimbabwe. Willing buyer, willing seller failed. The willing seller principle has not failed. It's the buyer that has failed. The willing seller principle means the constitution allows for expropriation for a public purpose. And there is an expropriation act in place. If you follow due process and if there is a valid claim on land, then you can expropriate. Government has not done it up to now because the expropriation has to be done on the willing seller principle. That's the only measurement for value. What is at the core of this debate is whether there should be market related compensation when land is transferred or not. That is what it is actually and, about. And we will talk about that, but let's talk about expropriation, Minister, because even Theo says, why, why is it that you're not expropriating? The Constitution says that uh, uh, we expropriate as a last resort. Then the reason we would want to use other, uh, to use the, uh, uh, says, we must study the history of the acquisition of the land and use that amongst others, not only the market value. That's the criticism that we accept, that we have overemphasized the market when there are other considerations that we should be making. If expropriation is a last resort, as yes. you say, then yes. why don't you buy more land? Are you putting enough cash into it? No, this? it's the cost. It's too enormous it's too huge this is why in the plan in the in the proposed plan national development plan we are saying the costs must be shared across by all key stakeholders in the process and we are suggesting 50 percent but that's a proposal that's a model i mean if we were to finish all the research on every claim for example we would not have the money if we were to go the sort of prices that we're getting and this is why the value general is critical to improve the valuation of land because often some of it is inflated for a variety of factors. Ruth Hall, help us out here. What is it? Is it a moral, historical injustice? Is it an economic issue? Is it political will? Why are we just not making headway? Clearly, this is an unresolved historical grievance. And I think that we've heard that just in terms of how the audience has responded. But I feel that a deep irony is that a lot of the concessions that the ANC fought for in the context of our political transition, it has choose not, chosen not to use those powers, the powers to expropriate, to pay uh, compensation other than market value. So for some reason, the concessions that were fought very hard for have not really been used. But I think it is an economic issue. I think that uh, it's, it's easy just to say, well, we just need to do more land reform. There's something else at stake here where that has not been clarified. And that is, while we have been going very slowly along the road of land reform, a very f profound shift has happened that is anti-poor in South Africa. And that is, we've globalized our agricultural sector. We have liberalized our economy. And now, people, farm workers, in places like De Durance, where we are today, are affected not only by the fact that there are, uh, there are workers in a commercial farm, but they're, they're subject to the vagaries of global capitalism. So I think that the big question that we haven't resolved, and that the ANC has not resolved, Minister, is what is the alternative vision? Yeah. Are we just going to to take commercial farms and transfer them from one white owner to one black owner because that's primarily what is happening under the current yeah. proactive land acquisition strategy or are we going to break them up let's talk about what that vision is i mean if you had to address the people of the dwarves yes, who are sitting yes. with us in this yes. room what is it is it land or is it money in their pockets she's no she's right at the macro level the the the, the, the nature of the positions that were adopted in the past created the current economic problems that we're confronting. It's the chickens coming home to roost. And so part of the call for a shift towards a smallholder farm, for example, support, so that you do not overemphasize the commercial part of it whilst you support it, it's a crucial part of the shift that she's talking about we need to go into. That's what we are moving towards. In other words, there's recognition that without providing critical support in that area, we will not be able to go that route. The people in this room, yes. we, they don't want you here, you passing the buck to the global economy. No. Yes, it has an impact, but right now, yes. they were asking for six, for, to move from 69 rand a day to yes. 150 rand a day yes. because they simply cannot afford to eat. Yes. What do you say to them? You see, that is the, the, the relationship 
on the farm, why is it being passed on to the government? No, Theo, let no. Minister, wait, wait, Theo. No, let me. Wait, let Minister, me, I, will let me answer. I will let you finish. Um, I will let you. No, no, I'm I will raising. Let you, I will let you finish that one. Yes, let me I finish. I do need to ask him that let question me finish because it, yes. people okay. are asking that possibly that question. And how would you respond to the minister? Seventy rand a day on a farm is pretty little. Every farmer would acknowledge that, but that is what is affordable. Six years ago, we still had a thriving tea industry in South Africa. And we produced a lot of the coffee we consume ourselves. But we could simply not compete with the labor input in Malawi, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. And today, we don't make one bag of tea in this country. The, the labor intensive stuff, like tomatoes, baby vegetables, export fruit for that matter, is simply going to crawl across our borders. And we are going to lose their jobs if the jobs are not market related. And that is what farmers can afford. And many of our members in AgriSA who are successful beneficiaries of land ref uh, reform, they are suffer for exactly that reason. There's not enough profit and the land which they got becomes poverty traps. If you cannot farm profitably, you cannot farm. Angela, he's got a point, but it's, it is a hard pill to swallow, but there's a point. Everybody on earth, by the way, protects their agricultural sector. The biggest thing that they fight in America and the Europeans in the World Trade Organization is protection of the agricultural economy. Our government does not do that. That's the first thing. But, but why, what will they uh, be protecting? Slavery. This is the point. The key point here is the agricultural sector in South Africa is based on slavery. And the ANC government has legislated that, that slavery. This is the problem that you see in the Durance. So before we can talk about wages, let us go first to address the land question. Let farm workers have their own land when they can make a choice whether I want to work for that guy or not. <laughs> And by the way, Siki, we shall not wish. By the way, it is the idea that we must buy our land. We didn't buy. This man says we must buy our land, stolen land. This we shall not do. There is no reason, Siki. I bet we are stolen land. When we return, we ask whether South Africa might actually benefit from a Zimbabwe style land reform program. You're watching The Big Debate. This assumption that there's a link between successful commercial farming and food security is something we really have to get rid of. A successful commercial farm does not necessarily contribute to food security. We hear in a wine growing area, what does wine do for our food security? <coughs> Theo de Jager is, is, is busy with forestry. They don't make their decisions based on our food security. They make it based on profit. White people, when they came here, they came with the dromedaries, Rachel, and who they were. And those vessels, they never carried any land. Yes. And it's so funny that you even protect them. Yes. Yeah. What are you doing? Yes. What, what, are you, what impression do you, do you give to your people? Why are you killing your people, bruh? Meneer, I want to say for you, for you, I've never said, people carry 70 grand a day, and that's enough for them. As I... Die 70 grand elke maand, die tien die einde van die maand, gaan u oorleef. En ons mense kry nie 70 grand a dag nie. Hulle kry 55 grand a dag in die Rosenwald area. Asseblief, u moet u sy feite reg het. A free for all is not going to benefit anybody. It's going to be to the detriment of every single person, including the people who get land. So again, let's go all the way to South Africa. I think I just love South Africans. South Africa, this is what I have for you today. Let's talk about land reforms in South Africa. Land has always been a central issue in South Africa, deeply intertwined with the, with the nation's history, politics, and social fabric. The struggle for land in South Africa dates back to the first instances of colonization and has continued through various forms of resistance, policies, and reforms. Now, land in South Africa, I think land is the greatest property someone can ever own. It has always been the greatest ever since the world was created. It was being given by our forefathers 
gave it to our great grandfathers our great grandfathers gave it to our grandfathers our grandfathers gave it to our fathers our fathers now give it to us this is also the same reason why kenyans were very angry when uh, there is a clause in the finance bill 2024 when they said uh, all land will be owned by the government and um the government will be taxing lands you will be paying rent to own your land and after some time uh, the government will be coming back to take your land so i understand and i really understand uh, why south africans are really campaigning on the issue of land reforms prime lands in south africa are owned by white people the africans do not really have good lands in south africa and this is very unfair considering it's called south africa yes it's the south of africa and africa is a continent of black people but white people have come there and have taken the prime lands from the africans this was not done today or yesterday this was done during the colonization during the ages of apartheid now there are being reforms there are land reforms that are being constitutionalized in south africa and these land reforms are trying to make amendments to make fair a uh, distribution of lands between the south african countries south africa is a rainbow country there's a lot of diverse culture diverse races but they are one country together they call themselves rainbow nation rainbow has different colors banded together but i think it's somehow fading away now there's a video i want us to watch a reaction video a, a debate video that is being done by uh, people in south africa they are discussing the issues of land reforms i want us to watch this video and then uh, have a huge context of what we are yet to talk about and by the end of the video i shall also share with you a deep critical analysis just like thousands of farm workers across south africa workers here in the dwarans work the land but don't own it and our government has failed to return much land into black hands despite repeated promises to our north in zimbabwe more radical land redistribution has been criticized for increasing poverty and hunger in that country so do calls for accelerated land reform in south africa threaten our future or are we simply postponing the inevitable finally land redistribution it aims to make land available primarily for food production but most farms redistributed to black farmers are no longer productive as a result government has missed its own target of redistributing 30% of land by 2014 to date less than 8% has been redistributed Commercial farmer interest groups such as Agri West Cape say they are committed to land reform but are concerned about food security. If we do land reform and we would like to have proper food security then we need to make it work. Food security means that we will have a growing population which will double up until 2030. So that'll mean that we will have to double up our food production. Under the current system dominated by a handful of commercial farmers the country produces enough food to feed the nation the irony is that farm workers are among the millions in the country who can't afford 3 meals a day faced with the reality of unemployment and food insecurity itemba small farmers association decided to take matters into their own hands in the late 90s they occupied about 75 hectares of abandoned state owned land and farmed on it selling their produce and stock to the surrounding communities government has since taken them to court for their illegal land seizure what is the problem of government they say vukuzenzela but if you do something can you move away get the land we don't want to go the zimbabwean way we fear it too we are going to come to a point where we become like zimbabwe people are going to start to take the, the land by force if you break the law uh where things are supposed to be done legally that is wrong the problem um at the prime minister is yes. that we are sitting at the moment yes. 8% of land has yes. been handed over yes. at this rate it's going to take you more than a century to give back half 
of the land that should be returned. There have been green papers, there have mm. been plans, there have been acknowledgements. Yes. How long should people wait? The problem with not doing it systematically is that we will rush into it and allow it to happen in a way that will not be sustainable. And we would like to move at the greatest speed possible. And the reason we have those things is to in fact ensure that once people get onto the land, they receive the support they deserve because they are not going to be able to sustain those things without support. Petrus, you're a farm worker leader and the minister says you need to be patient. The people of South Africa, the landless people, has been patient for years now. It, we have been in 18 years of democracy and the government promised to move 30% of land back to the landless people at 2014. But up till now, we, as, 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 as we know, only 5% of land has been transferred to the landless people. And I also hear that the, the minister said that uh, if people break the law, I don't know what law is the minister referring to, mm -hmm. because the Native Land Act was written in June, during June, uh, and it will be 100 years since our people has been dispossessed from, uh, from our land. So if the minister said, said that we break the law, it is actually wrong to say that South African citizens are breaking the law. It's in the Constitution, Petrus. This the Constitution. land was stolen from us. Yes. And the apartheid government, they write the laws, they write laws to move the land away from the indigenous people. Yes. They give the, our land to the people that come from Europe yes. in those days. So the government has the responsibility to write new laws yes. that make it possible for our people to have our land back. That's exactly what we are preparing legislation for. The problem with the occupation of land, we had to go to court the other day to remove people from land they occupied because that land was returned to their owners. So other people then come and occupy it. This is the problem that happens when people occupy land illegally in that sense, that they've successfully gotten their, their land back and then people go and occupy it. This is the problem when it happens unsystematically. We want to create an effective system for people to access land. And when they do, they must get support. Uh, yeah. the, the land, Andy, the minister does have a point. I mean, we can't just go the lawless route and just take what we think we want. What if poor people went and demanded that government goes and takes your house and your car to give it to somebody more deserving? The same party has been in power saying exactly the same thing every time. Why should we believe that this minister is going to change anything? The, the idea that we must respect unjust laws is evil, basic. But do two wrongs make a right? No, it is, it is, it, it, we are correcting any historical injustice. Now the government clearly has failed and it's not willing to do so. And people are therefore taking steps to correct this historical injustice. Everybody knows land was stolen, taken by force, by violence, by those who have it today. They say there's a historic injustice that needs to be corrected. And that's not what they are saying. They are saying that farmers who are currently on the land have stolen that land. Now I wonder why they didn't take the matter to the police. There are legislation in place, there are systems in place. The minister is right. We need to follow due process or we will put this land in the kind of chaos which we have seen in Zimbabwe. Willing buyer, willing seller failed. The willing seller principle has not failed. It's the buyer that has failed. The willing seller principle means the Constitution allows for expropriation for a public purpose. And there is an expropriation act in place. If you follow due process and if there is a valid claim on land, then you can expropriate. Government has not done it up to now because the expropriation has to be done on the willing seller principle. That's the only measurement for value. What is at the core of this debate is whether there should be market-related compensation when land is transferred or not. That is what it is actually and, about. And we will talk about that, but let's talk about expropriation, Minister, because even Theo says, why, why is it that you're not expropriating? The Constitution says that uh, uh, we expropriate as a last resort. Then the reason we would want to use other uh, to use the, uh, uh, says,
we must study the history of the acquisition of the land and use that amongst others, not only the market value. That's the criticism that we accept, that we have overemphasized the market when there are other considerations that we should be making. If expropriation is a last resort, as yes. you say, then yes. why don't you buy more land? Are you putting enough cash into it? No, this? it's the cost. It's too enormous it's too huge this is why in the plan in the in the proposed plan national development plan we are saying the costs must be shared across by all key stakeholders in the process and we are suggesting 50 percent but that's a proposal that's a model i mean if we were to finish all the research on every claim for example we would not have the money if we were to go the sort of prices that we are getting and this is why the value general is critical to improve the valuation of land because often some of it is inflated for a variety of factors. Ruth Hall, help us out here. What is it? Is it a moral, historical injustice? Is it an economic issue? Is it political will? Why are we just not making headway? Clearly, this is an unresolved historical grievance. And I think that we've heard that just in terms of how the audience has responded. But I feel that a deep irony is that a lot of the concessions that the ANC fought for in the context of our political transition, it has choose not, chosen not to use those powers, the powers to expropriate, to pay uh, compensation other than market value. So for some reason, the concessions that were fought very hard for have not really been used. But I think it is an economic issue. I think that uh, it's, it's easy just to say, well, we just need to do more land reform. There's something else at stake here with, that has not been clarified. And that is, while we have been going very slowly along the road of land reform, a very f profound shift has happened that is anti-poor in South Africa. And that is, we've globalized our agricultural sector. We have liberalized our economy. And now, people, farm workers, in places like De Durance, where we are today, are affected not only by the fact that there are, uh, there are workers in a commercial farm, but they're, they're subject to the vagaries of global capitalism. So I think that the big question that we haven't resolved, and that the ANC has not resolved, Minister, is what is the alternative vision? Yeah. Are we just going to take commercial farms and transfer them from one white owner to one black owner because that's primarily what is happening under the current yeah. proactive land acquisition strategy or are we going to break them up? Let's talk about what that vision is. I mean if you had to address the people of the Dwarves yes, who are sitting yes. with us in this yes. room, what is it? Is it land or is it money in their pockets? She's, no, she's right at the macro level that the, 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 the nature of the positions that were adopted in the past created the current economic problems that we're confronting. It's the chickens coming home to roost. And so part of the call for a shift towards a smallholder farm, for example, support, so that you do not overemphasize the commercial part of it whilst you support it, it's a crucial part of the shift that she's talking about we need to go into. That's what we are moving towards. In other words, there's recognition that without providing critical support in that area, we will not be able to go that route. The people in this room, yes. we, they don't want you here, you passing the buck to the global economy. No. Yes, it has an impact, but right now, yes. they were asking for six, for, to move from 69 rand a day to yes. 150 rand a day yes. because they simply cannot afford to eat. Yes. What do you say to them? You see, that is the, the, the relationship on the farm. Why is it being passed on to the government? Theo? No, no, no. Minister, wait, wait. Theo? No, let me. Wait, let Minister. Me, I, will let me answer. I will let you finish. Um, I will let you, no, no, I'm raising. I will let you finish that one. Yes, let me I finish. I do need to ask him that let question. Let me finish because it, yes. People okay. are asking that, possibly that question. And how would you respond to the Minister? 70 rand a day on a farm is pretty little. Every farmer would acknowledge that. But that is what is affordable. Six years ago, we still had a thriving tea industry in South Africa. And we produced a lot of the coffee we consume ourselves. But we could simply not compete with the labor input in Malawi, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. And today, we don't make one bag of tea in this country. The, the labor intensive stuff, like tomatoes, baby vegetables, export fruit for that matter, is simply going to crawl across our borders. And we are going to lose their jobs if the jobs are not market related. And that is what farmers can afford. And many of our members in AgriSA who are successful beneficiaries of land ref uh, reform, they are suffer for exactly that reason. 
There is not enough profit, and the land which they got becomes poverty traps. If you cannot farm profitably, you cannot farm. Angela, he's got a point, but it's, it is a hard pill to swallow, but there's a point. Everybody on earth, by the way, protects their agricultural sector. The biggest thing that they fight in America and the Europeans in the World Trade Organization is protection of the agricultural economy. Our government does not do that. That's the first thing. But, but why, what will they uh, be protecting? Slavery. This is the point. The key point here is the agricultural sector in South Africa is based on slavery. And the ANC government has legislated that, that slavery. This is the problem that you see in the Durance. So before we can talk about wages, let us go first to address the land question. Let farm workers have their own land when they can make a choice whether I want to work for that guy or not. <laughs> And by the way, Siki, we shall not wish. By the way, it is the idea that we must buy our land. We didn't buy. This man says must buy our land, stolen land. This we shall not do. There is no reason, Siki. I bet our stolen land. When we return, we ask whether South Africa might actually benefit from a Zimbabwe style land reform program. You're watching The Big Debate. This assumption that there's a link between successful commercial farming and food security is something we really have to get rid of. A successful commercial farm does not necessarily contribute to food security. We hear in a wine growing area, what does wine do for our food security? <coughs> Theo de Jager is, is, is busy with forestry. They don't make their decisions based on our food security, they make it based on profit. White people, when they came here, they came with the dromedaries, Rachel, and who they were. And those vessels, they never carried any land. Yeah. And it's so funny that you even protect them. Yes. Yeah. What are you doing? Yes. What, what, are you, what impression do you, do you give to your people? Why are you killing your people, bruh? Meneer, I want to say for you, for you, I've never said Mensen krijgen 70 rand per dag en dat is genoeg voor hulle. Als u die 70 rand elke maand tot die, die einde van die maand gaan u oorleef. En ons mensen krijgen nie 70 rand per dag. Hulle krijgen 55 rand per dag in die Rosenwald area. Asseblief, u moet u so feite recht het. A free for all is not going to benefit anybody. It's going to be to the detriment of every single person, including the people who get land. Welcome back to the big debate on land taking place here in the Dwarans in the Western Cape. Now, land reform in Zimbabwe has been criticized across the world for turning that country from a bread basket to a basket case. But is that the full story? Recently, some South Africans have called for a more radical Zimbabwe-style land reform program in this country. Would that be a good idea? And Theo, a good question for you. Uh, what is exactly your concern about Zimbabwe-style land reform program, particularly when it comes to food security? My family is still in Zimbabwe. They no longer farm there. But we have seen how that currency has lost 99% of its value, how runaway inflation has really impoverished people, how they had to run across the border to work in, in, in South Africa. Many of them today work on our farms, although they are pretty well trained. Zimbabwe did something right with education. And yet, nothing could save that economy. And today, the agricultural production output is so much down. And I know that with PLAS, they had a, um, recently uh, put a paper out where they feel that Zimbabwe has actually accomplished something with improved production output. But it is not a fraction from what it used to be in the days when Zimbabwe was still the envy of the world's cattle industry. Should something like that happen in South Africa, there is no future for any one of us. Zimbabwe today has nothing to be proud of. Ben Cousins, would you agree that Zimbabwe is a basket case? You've been looking at some studies that, that seem to show a different picture. There's accumulating evidence that land reform in Zimbabwe is not a disaster. Particularly on the small scale A1 farms, production is going up. 
Uh, in, in some crops, production has exceeded that which it was before 2000. For example, cotton is 130% of what it was before. Mm -hmm. Groundnuts are, are up, sorghum is up. S tobacco has been increasing in recent years, it's up to 70% of what it used to be. Maize production is 30% down on what it was in the 1990s. That's partly because of shortages of inputs and partly because of drought. So yes, there have been uh, real positives. There were negatives as well. For example, uh, some large-scale commercial farming crops have declined. Uh, for example, horticulture. Yeah. And foreign exchange isn't as being earned at the same extent as before. There were human rights abuses. Uh, there was disinvestment. But the decline of the Zimbabwean economy is not due solely to land reform. And the key lesson for South Africa is that we must get the benefits of land reform without the costs, right. which the Zimbabwe situation which is. Which is Zimbabwe. Antile, you, you've said in the past that if you were given a farm, you probably wouldn't farm it. So I've got to ask the question because there is the point about food security. So we give you a farm, you sit on it, or we give people farms and they don't actually farm. Who's going to produce our food? In fact, the biggest positive is not a economic that the professor uh, cousin has mentioned it is the fact that 4,000 white people owned 80% of Zimbabwe that has changed now we have more than 300,000 families sitting on that land it means that Zimbabwean people have returned their country back to them and they have that what we can call real freedom this is the biggest uh, benefit of that land reform process but the people he's talking about are farming I'm asking about those people in South Africa who don't, not necessarily but, but want I, to own a farm no 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 absolutely the point is to understand what you're doing with land reform you're not giving land necessarily just for economic reason you are addressing a historical injustice is when they stole our land, by the way, here, they were not saying, oh, we're taking your land because you have been unproductive. They destroyed the productive systems of our people. So we want that land back. But we still need to eat. You let's must, address, course, let's address, address my question because you need to eat, I need to eat. No, absolutely. By the way, from Zimbabwe, we know you give people land. Already they'll start producing, but you must do something else. Our government is totally failing. Support the people on land, otherwise you're setting up for failure. That's what you need to do. Theo, I have to ask you this question on food security. Absolutely a very important issue. But food security for whom? Because if you go to Woolies and you go to pick and pay, those uh, shelves are full. But most, some of the people in this room cannot afford to go to Woolies and go to pick and pay. Shouldn't we put in, be putting money in their pockets so that they can go and buy and access the food at pick and pay and Woolies or land then to grow the food? Food security does not mean that you need to produce everything you consume or for that matter consume everything you produce. It means that you produce enough of that in which you have a competitive advantage so that there is money available to buy that which you cannot competitively uh, produce. There is a, must, a distinction must be made between household food security, with which we have a problem in certain areas of South Africa, and national food security. And let's be very clear about this. In a country where more and more people every day are dependent on food from shelves, there is no way you can provide through smallholder farming. There you need massive scale, large scale farming to produce for that. But yes, where people live in rural areas, there should be opportunities. And there must be, like in the rest of Africa and in the rest of, of um, the Southern Hemisphere, where people can produce for themselves but they will never be able to produce everything they need from, for themselves. Petrus, it's a bit romantic, right, to think that everybody can go and produce food, right? So if the minister took Theo's land and gave it to you, what guarantee do we have that you're actually not going to mess it up? I don't think we can give guarantees. <coughs> because in many instances, we have the government has, has uh, done uh, 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 small minorities of, of land reform where they have given la land to people but they have never built the capacity of the people and make sure that this, those people have uh, resources as the white commercial farmers have. Let me, let me ask the people in the room, if the minister were to take um, the farms and give them over to you, what are you going to do with them? Are you going to farm? Who wants to talk to me? I'm going to go up there. I'm one of the, the farm owners of Itemba, which means hope. We've got about 175 farmers on that farm. Nobody's assisting us. We are doing our own farming. 
We don't get any help from the government. The government even come there and cut our water, so we can't supply water to our animals. But we're still farming. The minister here does not know what he's talking about. We are farming on the white man's farm. Why can't we? F and we're still farming on our own land. Although we took that land, we took it by force because we got no other al uh, alternative. Currently, we are supplying in, in the Western Cape, in Easter River, we're supplying the people yeah. in that area with food from our farms. And we, we're farming on 60 by 35 meters of, 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 of land. And we're 175 farmers there. And we are making a success, okay. although we're struggling. Minister. Again, the Vukuz and Zele spirit we were talking about, they're doing it on their own without support. Assuming we wanted to, f to support them, let's say we had to support them, how would we use the basis for supporting them if, if we are if required the, the money we have now, the recapitalization and development program that we have? We have over 400 farms that we are supporting as we speak today. All right? And uh, all over the country, sir. All, all over the country. And no, 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 hang on. Let's give Let's, the minister okay, a chance to okay. finish this, this statement. No. And if you so can't to, finish the statement, be, then we be, can't respond to him. To be able Everyone to, in the room will get a chance. To be able That's to support it? them, which is what we would like to do. Uh, we would have to regularize that first. Okay. But if you have gotten the land no. to them, Do you see the problem and not that sitting at 8%. In other words, he says they occupied it by force. So if we go and support that, uh, so we have to, no, what we are saying uh, is that uh, if, if it is not legal as we speak now, it is not. Can it give is, the minister no, a chance okay. to respond, please. Okay. Otherwise, this is going to deteriorate. <laughs> minister, how are we going to resolve it then? Because as you can see, people are saying enough is enough. We want no, to do this. No. What, what, what do you think we need no, to do? No, what we need to do is, is very clear. It's very clear. You see, there, there's a whole range of opportunities. The point I was trying to make earlier on is that there's a lot of things, both that uh, business, labor, in other words, workers themselves, showing initiative, creating, sh identifying opportunities for us to go in to support those initiatives. The point we are making is that in instances where people take it by force, the, unfortunately, government operates by law. Okay. Ruth, l l let me ask you this question, because you, you mentioned a very important word a little bit earlier, and that was there's a lot of emotion in this debate. It makes it very difficult to actually do what you were saying a little bit earlier, and that's look at the key problems. Well, I think that there have been different problems over time, and we're talking about land reform as if it's all one thing and we agree what it looks like. In fact, we've had three quite different land reform programs since 94. In the first five years, we had a program that was for the poor. It was only for the poor, and the aim was to give people a place that they could call their own. But in the second period, uh, from 2000 or, or so onwards under Mbeki, there was a new land reform program which was focused on black economic empowerment, and the aim there was to create black capitalist farmers to work alongside the white commercial farming class. And this was a model of, of course, is, is, is a more attractive model for white commercial farmers who want black counterparts, but it doesn't address the kinds of concerns yes. that have been expressed by many of the workers in this room because essentially the farm owner changes but the same labor conditions continue uh, in its place. And in the third period, since about 2006, we've had a proactive land acquisition strategy where the state is now buying the land itself. And this, I think, is very important because uh, this uh, example has shown us that when the state is the owner, it is not always going to act in the, in the best interests of the poor. In this case, the state as a landlord is protecting its own property rights against people who would like to use that land. So now we see the state buying whole commercial farms and making them available on lease to black commercial Now, farmers. we've seen clearly how uh, the South Africans are experiencing difficulties uh, with the land uh, issues in South Africa. And I was so amazed to see that we also have people from Netherlands. The guy speaking the weird language, the white guy, that guy is speaking Danish. Danish is a language they speak in, no, Denmark. In Netherlands, they speak uh, Dutch. Yeah. So the guy was speaking Dutch, and you can see they are clearly suffering. So it is an issue that is predominant. There's a certain class or certain race that is really benefiting so much from mismanagement of land and the grabbing of land. But now the people 
want the land back. Here's what I can I gathered from the video. So one thing I want us to discuss is let's have a history of land grabbing and land appropriation in South Africa. Now the very first instance of land appropriation in South Africa can be traced back to 1652 when Jan van Riebrick, an agent of the Dutch East Indian Company, established a supply station at the Cape of Good Hope. Remember these people came as settlers in South Africa. And now there's a place called the Cape of Good Hope which is I think it's a small island uh, towards the south of South Africa. Now this uh this man marked the beginning of European colonization in the region. The arrival of the Dutch settlers led to the dispossession of land from the indigenous Khoikhoi and the San people if you like Khoisan or the Hottentots. The colonialists gradually expanded their territory using a combination of military force, treaties and coercion. The British colonization that followed in the 19th century further entrenched land dispossession. The introduction of the 181 of the 1820 settlers in the Eastern Cape was a strategy by the British to establish a buffer zone against the Hausa people of South Africa, leading to a numerous conflict known as the Sosa Hausa Wars or Frontier Wars. This was uh, resulted in the further displacement of the Hausa people and the appropriation of their land. This land issue is not something which started yesterday. It has always been there as far as eight, one, uh, 1820, the year 1820, or if, if if you like 1820 AD, we had the Hausa people. The Hausa is a tribe in South Africa. Uh, the Zulu. Uh, we have them. The Khoisan, the Khoikhoi, the Hottentots. There are so many over there. Now, these people have been fighting the white people against land, but nothing has been happening all along. During those days, the European had superior technology than the ones Africans had. They had guns. Africans, uh, they just had um, spears and crude weapons. You can never compare a spear to an automatic machine gun. You can never do that. If you try you will see what uh, King Chekitile Ngwale did when he made his people die after pouring on them uh, millet millet and some water from river Rufiji it's a very interesting story of resilience and determination yeah now apartheid and land dispossession the most systemic and institutionalized form of land dispossession occurred during the apartheid era the apartheid era took place in 1948 three years after the second world war to 1994 when south africa got its independence the apartheid government implemented a series of laws that stripped black south africans of their land rights the native land act of 1913 which predated apartheid but laid the groundwork prohibited black people from owning or renting land outside designated reserves which constituted only 7% of the country's land 93% was belonging to the black to the white people 7% black people 93% white people owned land during apartheid the group areas act of 1950 enforced racial segregation by assigning different racial groups to specific residential and business zones This act led to the forced removal of millions of South Africans from their homes whom were relocated to underdeveloped and overcrowded areas called bantu stands and homelands. These areas were often located in marginal lands with poor agricultural potential, exacerbating poverty and inequality. You see the white people were complaining food security, food security, they have big land because of food security. You know when somebody wants to take something from you they will always find a way that will justify their evil actions to these people it is food security the africans can also have a food security it's not like we are incapable of doing food security we are so much capable actually when the europe was starving africa was not starving when asia was starving africa was not starving even in the bible egypt had plenty of food israel and those other countries were starving Tell me Africa 
those bad things happen over there, not in Africa. They happen in Africa after you bring them here. Now, the struggle for land reforms. The end of apartheid in 1994 brought hope for redressing historical injustices. The African National Congress, the ANC, the major party in South Africa, which was led by Nelson Mandela, introduced a comprehensive land reform program aimed at redistributing land, re uh, restoring land rights, and ensuring security of tenure. The program had three main components, land restitution, land redistribution, and land tenure reform. Now, what is land restitution? The component aimed to return land or provide compensation to those who were dispossessed after 1913 is called land restitution. Restitute what you took. Return back what you stole. That is what restitution means in its most basic form. To this context, it was land. Now, it had to be returned. You understand? The restitution of land React, a Land Rights Act of 1994 allowed individuals and communities to file claims for land lost due to discriminatory laws. While some successes were achieved, the process has been slow and fraught with challenges, including bureaucratic uh, inefficiencies and inadequate support for beneficiaries. The second one, what is land redistribution? The goal for this component of land distribution was to redistribute land to the landless and poor to promote equitable ownership of the South African land. Initially, the willing buyer, the willing seller model was adopted in South Africa, where the government purchased land from willing sellers to, re to redistribute. However, this market-based approach proved inadequate in meeting the ambitions, uh, in meeting the ambitious targets are uh, set by the government. The third one is land tenor system. This aimed to secure tenor for those uh, living on communal land, farm works, and those in informal settlements. The extension of security of Tenure Act, ESTA, of 1997, sought to protect farm workers from arbitrary eviction and promote their rights to reside on and use the land. However, our implementation has been uneven and eviction have been continued in many areas. So the ANC got into power at least to ensure land goes back to the black people. They implemented three tenants, land restitution, land redistribution, and land tenure system. Now, what are some of the land reforms challenges that South Africans are facing today? According to the video, I've noticed that despite the most the post-apartheid uh, government effort, land reform in South Africa remains a contentious and unresolved issue. Several factors redistribute to the slow pace and initial success of land reform initiatives. Uh, first one would be bureaucratic inefficiencies. The land reforms is often bogged down by administrative delays, lack of coordination, and insufficient capacity within government departments. The second one is funding constraints. Uh, the reliance on willing buyer, willing seller model has hindered rapid and extensive land redistribution. Many argue for more proactive measures, including expropriation without compensation. Another one is beneficiary support. Many land reform beneficiaries lack the necessary skill, resource, and support to effectively utilize the land, leading to underutilization and failure of redistribution uh, of the land projects. The last one would be political and social tension as a challenge being faced. The minister is politically uh, inclined, you understand? Land reforms is a politically sensitive issue, often exploited for political gain. Social tensions between different racial and economic groups further complicate the process. That is what you can see. Uh, the, at least the government, the ANC government, has been doing something to ensure a land goes back to the black person, land goes back to the rightful owners, uh, there is land redistribution, there is land restitution, and there is land tenure system. Now, the history of um, land uh, struggles and reforms in South Africa is a testament to the deep-rooted and complex nature of the issue.
from the first instance of land appropriation by European colonizer to the apartheid era dispossession and the ongoing challenges of land reforms, the quest for land justice continues to shape South Africa's socio-political landscape. Addressing these historical injustices requires a multifaceted approach that combines effective policy implementation, uh, Im adequate funding and meaningful support for beneficiaries while fostering social cohesion and political will. Only through such comprehensive efforts can South Africa hope to achieve a more equitable and just land ownership. One thing I love about these kind of conversations is that people are able to come together, people are able to discuss, people are able to put their differences aside. That, that is what I love about the Rainbow Nation. But I feel like it's somehow fading. Maybe it might not be the Rainbow Nation, but let me call it South Africa. That's what I love about South Africa. It's multiracial, it has different cultures, and in these differences, people come together in their differences and they find a commonality. Such debates are commonalities that should bring people together for them to coexist and live together, not just coexist, live together. Yeah. That's my analysis of this video. I hope you find value in it. And if you do, please uh, share the video, subscribe, give me a super thanks. I will so much appreciate. Um, comment, share with your friends. Yeah. See you in the next one. Remember to love being African. Appreciate yourself more and more each day and each coming moment. See you in the next video.